Hey everyone, good to see you. It's Richard and um, I haven't given an update for a while. I haven't spoken to the camera. I've stayed fairly quiet actually, which is um, uh, uh, probably a relief to some of you. And um, so there's a, the difference today is that I'm filming this on a different camera and I'm filming it on uh, filming in 4K, which means you can probably see everything, every blemish. You might be noticing for the first time that I don't have any hair, but if you look very closely, that's a frightening shot for you, isn't it, out of a horror movie? It's like an Easter egg. Uh, there is hair, so that's quite exciting. And, and equally as exciting that in a few weeks it will be completely blasted and eradicated again. But anyway, I'll tell you about that in a minute. It's, um, the, good, the good news is that it's spring. In London we have spring, it's definitely spring, regardless of what the clocks might tell us. Um, in my world, this is spring. So we have some sunshine and we have uh, just little flowers and snowdrops and some crocuses appearing. And uh, these, which uh, some of you will remember that I, the last time I said the flowers I had were um, hydrangeas and they were hyacinths. Thank you for correcting me. These are ranunculus. <laughs> and I am right this time. And I love them because they are like peonies and they are this kind of I'm so fixated by this sacred geometry of them look at them they're absolutely stunning so anyway ranunculus uh, there'll be no correcting me on my flowers today um so I wanted to come on and give you an update and um and say hello and I know it's been uh, probably almost three weeks since I gave any update I feel pretty good actually physically I feel um, yeah, pretty well. I have some side effects and I'm still propped up by some drugs and I still am having to fiddle around with pain medication because I've got pain in um, one of my bones. Um, but generally my taste has come back and I've got a bit of energy and I'm doing some dog walks with Kelly, which is lovely to be with Kelly and with Royston and out in the fresh air. So pretty much my sleeping at the moment's a bit shit. Five o'clock, I seem to wake up, and I don't know what that is, but um, but generally, I am feeling well. Uh, our our home world is busy. Kelly's settling into her new jobs, and um, is I think is a kind of I guess finding that balance between um, what is new and. Uh, different and exciting and actually some rhythm, some regular rhythm, but also realising that she's lost the adrenaline rush that we had in the first couple of months, which was uh, kind of crazy, frantic, knowing what was happening and what next. Uh, Mia is just seemingly a superhero, how she manages life and school and A-levels and uh, a job uh, on Friday nights and Saturdays. And um, she did a gig which she did at really short notice with like 28 songs, many of which she'd never sung before. I mean, I don't know, the, the, kid, is my, the kid is my superhero. And um, yeah, she is. So um, I was actually just thinking back to the day when I had to tell her that I had, that I had stage four cancer. I still struggled to say it, I had stage four. I had stage four cancer because I guess I'm in remission, so I don't have it. And that was the hardest, the hardest day of my life, the hardest conversation I've ever had to have. Um, she is really fucking amazing, as is Kelly. And I already knew that. And she continues to surprise me and Mia continues to surprise me. So, um, so hmm. we're moving into the next stage. So I had anticipated that my transplant, my bone marrow transplant would be, I thought, eight weeks from now-ish, and that would take us to the end of May, June. Um, it's speeding up a little bit. So uh, both of my brothers got tissue tested to see if they were a match, and neither of them are. One of them isn't at all, and one of them is only half a match, so not really enough to be, um, to be good for what I need, to be valuable. So they have gone out to a uh, a donor list and there are lots of donors who are a really good match. I think a perfect match only comes from a family member, but they're a really good match, which is good to know as a backup. 
but the, my doctor team, my medical team have chosen that I'm going to have a stem cell, which means that in a few weeks they're going to harvest my own uh, cells. And then about three weeks after that, they're go I'm going to go back in again, which will be in hospital for four weeks. So around the 25th of April, it looks like the next few weeks are going to have quite a lot of hospital appointments and injections in my tummy and various tests. Uh, and that starts tomorrow. So I'm going with Kelly to meet um, the team and my consultant, my transplant consultant. So it's all happening and it's happening really fast. And we only found out on Friday and I do feel a little bit steamrolled. A part of me is excited and anxious. Um, uh, yeah, like this rebirthing process is what it feels like. Um, so uh, I was going to mention about the Anthony Nolan Trust and um, which we'll put a link to and the, I guess the need for people to be blood donors and to go to a blood bank and either give platelets if you can or donate blood. I'll, I'll put a link in, it just feels, I don't know if you do it and if you are, some people are not able to, uh, their, their system just is not able to and their blood is not right. But my encouragement would be that you go and test yourself and see because it just feels, I feel it is life-saving. Uh, because if my own cells weren't good enough and we had to go out to a list, if I was a very unusual group, blood group, uh, there'd be a problem. So, um, so that's what the next few weeks looks like. <clears throat> and... Um, and then I'll be in for four weeks and then my recovery will be however long. Um, three to six months is the, is the word on the streets, but that might be very different. Um, I'm having my pick line taken out. This is a pick line in case you didn't know. I didn't know what a freaking pick line was, but this has been in since December. It's a two, two prong, two tubes, two things that come off the end of it. And then this line goes into here and inside and into my heart. So that's cleaned every week. They use it to take blood. They use it to give me my IV medicine. So this is coming out on Friday, exciting. Uh, and then if, uh, a week or so before my transplant, I'll have a Hickman line fitted, which is similar, but goes in my chest. Um, so all, all shaking up, this is definitely moving into the next phase. Um, Willow Tree continues to move forward. We're still looking for our family, so please, push people forward. We then have to give it to our trustees who will look at a collection of them and make a decision. So we have two families to support. Again, we'll pop the links in. Um, I'm so grateful to people who are doing uh, different walks and runs and charity events. So um, we posted about Cliff doing the half marathon in Wimbledon, raised over 500 pounds for us. Uh, we have Manu doing a uh, a walk at Hampton Court in, I think, May. She's training for that. She doesn't like running, uh, so she's pushing herself for, for it, and it's amazing. Uh, Kelly's doing, I think it's called the Walk of Light, or is it called the Walk of Life? Damn hell. I can't remember. It's not the Walk of Damn Hell. Anyway, that's in April. I think it's in April, and that's uh, 10K. And... Uh, that's amazing, do, be, do, doing with some other people, which is all supporting blood cancers. So there's lots going on in raising money and it's in some ways it's quietened off a bit. I'll push for it because we've just focused on me being well and recovering from the chemo. Um, and as we've said before, it'd be easy for both of us to get lost in another business and um, we're resisting that. And it continues to move forward, which is exciting. And I guess really the last few weeks, as well as getting myself well and starting to work with Brian, who is an amazing personal trainer and really looking at my body from a holistic perspective and strengthening and core strength and stability and back into alignment, that's also working with my mindset. But I'm just, uh, I'm processing a lot at the moment and I'm going to read you a poem in a minute, which I want to share. And talk about, actually I'm going to talk about it first because I realised in the last few weeks I felt really sad, uh, just sad and I can't really express that that's a feeling I feel as though I've had before, it doesn't feel very familiar and I can't really describe what sadness is like, it feels like it's very heavy hearted, it feels like my heart is pulled down to my stomach and there's a, the energy feels quite cumbersome to carry around. It feels quite a burden. 
Um, and I, I realize how we don't talk about it very much. We don't talk about sadness and we don't encourage people to be sad. And what surprised me is that, and this is all with good intention, you might be watching this going, go, I'm one of those people, is that, and I know that I have done this in the past, is attempt to scoop people out of sadness because we don't think it's the right place for them to be and we want them to be more positive and hopeful. And we attempt to scoop them up and we can do that in all manner of ways. Just, and it can be just a pick yourself up, look on the bright side. And some people have said to me, you know, at least you're not in Ukraine. Um, uh, you know, kind of go, well, no, I'm not in Ukraine. I'm sitting here in Surbiton with my problems. And Ukraine, uh, which is also a heavy thing we're carrying, uh, a, a planetary level, it feels like. Um, they're in their problems there and, and there are problems and my problems are their problems and this is all very shared. But here I am sitting in my little world of sadness. And, and it's just struck me how we teach and encourage happiness, but we don't teach people how to be sad. And that might sound a bit silly where go, how do we want to teach them? Why do we want people to be sad? I don't think we want people to be sad. I think, because I can only do it, talk from my perspective, that what I need is to almost be in my sadness in order to discharge it and in order to make sense of it and in order to learn from what is going on in my system mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, is to be in my sadness, is to sit with it. And I don't know when it will clear. It's like I'm reading a great book by Catherine May called Wintering, where she talks about, you know, we have these seasons and they're cyclical, but we have them for a reason. If we attempt to just go, let's have summer all the time and where we can skip around in our shorts and get a suntan, we, we can't have that. We have to have winter and at the end of winter comes spring. But we can't fast track winter. We can't speed it up. And winter is a time of kind of regrouping and feels some sadness and some heaviness for me to winter. Um, I'm just really struck by how we, we are not good at encouraging people and allowing them to be sad as a, as a very normal and required human reaction and response to be sad. So here I am, I guess, sitting with a lot of sadness and some of that is grief grief for what was familiar in my life, what was known, what was predictable, what I enjoyed, uh, a grief for some of the stuff in my life that was probably a bit shit and wasn't really needed anymore and it passed its sell-by date. And there is a grieving for what I don't have now, my client work and my psychotherapy training and my interactions with people and just being able to see people um, without being masked up. There's all of that stuff which just feels really sad. Um, so I guess my, my encouragement for you, and I know lots of people watch this and just want the updates and they'll have switched off by now because they go, I know what's happening and I don't need this gushy wallowing bit, um, <laughs> is just to, I guess, just check your own state you're in and allow your, and, and acknowledge it and make room for it. And also noticing other people's sadness and allowing them to be in it. It's, it's like, it's your discomfort if you're attempting to move someone out of their sadness. It's really hard to be with someone who is in a place of sadness, I think. Um, how do we sit with that? How do we be present with it and, and let it happen and let it run its course until spring arrives, until there are some new buds and new shoots? So that's kind of where I am. And, and, and I have a huge amount of gratitude and I have moments of absolute joy and delight and happiness. And there's a backdrop at the moment of some, just some gray of this is all happening really fast. And how come I'm sitting here with no hair talking to you about this with a pick line and ready to have a full bone marrow transplant? I don't know. God, a bit heavy. You might have switched off by now. I'll be pouring yourself a double whiskey or something, but I'm going to read a poem to you and I have to wear my glasses, which reminds me of Larry Grayson. Google Larry Grayson because he's also the king of 
I was going to say he's the king of strap-ons, but that's not what I meant. But he, but potentially he were, is or was. Um, this is a book. Uh, this is a poem by John Donahue, John O'Donohue, sorry. And this poem just really speaks to me, and it speaks to me, and will speak to people who are watching this who have, who have, or who have had a serious illness. And actually, I think it applies to all of us in a way. So I'm going to read it, and then just let you sit with it, and then I'm going to shut the hell up. It's called For a Friend on the Arrival of Illness, and it's a, it's a blessing written by him. Now is the time of dark invitation, beyond the frontier you did not expect. Abruptly, your old life seems distant. You barely noticed how each day opened, a path through fields never questioned, yet expected deep down to hold treasure. Now your time on earth becomes full of threat. Before your eyes, your future shrinks. You live absorbed in the day-to-day, -day, so continuous with everything around you that you could forget you were separate. Now this dark companion has come between you. Distances have opened in your eyes. You feel that against your will, a stranger has married your heart. Nothing before has made you feel so isolated and lost. When the reverberations of shock subside in you, May grace come to restore you to balance. May it shape a new space in your heart. To embrace this illness as a teacher who has come to open your life to new worlds. May you find in yourself a courageous hospitality towards what is difficult, painful and unknown. May you learn to use this illness as a lantern to illuminate the new qualities that will emerge in you. May the fragile harvesting of this slow light help to release whatever has become false in you. May you trust this light to clear a path through all the fog of old unease and anxiety until you feel arising within you a tranquility, profound enough to call the storm to stillness. May you find the wisdom to listen to your illness, ask why it came, why it chose your friendship, where it wants to take you, what it wants you to know what quality of space it wants to create in you, what you need to learn to become more fully yourself that your presence may shine in the world. May you keep faith with your body, learning to see it as a holy sanctuary which can bring this night wound gradually towards the healing and freedom of dawn. May you be granted the courage and vision to work through passivity and self-pity to see the beauty you can harvest from the riches of this dark invitation. May you learn to receive it graciously and promise to learn swiftly that it may leave you newborn, willing to dedicate your time to birth. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that I got through it without sobbing my eyes out. Um, because, ev because actually every line in it strikes a chord in me, the dark invitation that arrived to me on December the 7th arrived to me and my family. An invite to show up, my soul tapping me on the shoulder. He talks about opening the, finding this space in our heart, using this as a teacher. I'm doing my best to use this as a teacher, as a guide, so that it may illuminate a path. So, I might, I, some of you might still be watching. I know I say that every time and it's okay if you're not. And I know lots of you will comment saying, I'm still watching. Um, the fact that I'm recording this in 4K frightens me because potentially by the time I've uploaded it anywhere, I will have a full head of hair. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up because I've probably gone on too long. I'll update you again soon. I'm going to do a short, aha, only 17 minutes. Uh, uh, video every day from being in hospital. Um, I'm going to do it actually because I want to talk my story through and some days that will be like a tragedy. It will be it will be a melodramatic deep wallowing moment and other days will be um, more hopeful. But I'm going to do that every day whatever whatever I find myself in. Um, but as always I thank you for your your kindness and your messages I know that come after this and your words of support and, and some of you don't send those and I know that you still hold them and send them our way. Um, yeah, so you, I can't describe how grateful we are. So I send you a lot of love 
and look after yourselves, notice your sadness and your happiness and allow, allow both of them to have a place and then all the emotions around them. And yeah, that poem was for those of you who have been through serious illness, have just got bad news and actually have had any difficult news to deal with in your life. How do we use what is happening as a teacher and a guide? I'm out of here. Uh, lots of love to you and um, I'll see you soon. Bye.